Um, please join me in welcoming our next and final speaker, Ward Briggs, as I discovered from his Wikipedia page, a native son of Southern California, born in nearby Riverside. But Ward, in matters of uh, the history of classical scholarship, really needs no introduction for he was until 20. 11, Carolina Distinguished Professor of Classics and Lewis Fry Scudder Professor of Humanities at the University of South Carolina, where he established himself as one of the leading lights in the field. I'm speaking in particular of his 1994 publication, uh, the, A Biographical Dictionary of North American Classicists. Many of you will know and uh, perhaps have a similar experience to mine uh, of dealing with wards in, in his retirement which has been busy, to say the least. Uh, and I'm speaking about the database of, um, uh, let me see if I get this right, because I have it here some way, uh, of classical scholars. Um, for I have been, I won't say pestered, but uh, reminded to um, send in images of forgotten Jesuits at Fordham University for uh, this handsome website. Jesuits with names like Grimaldi and Doyle, uh, and I am very grateful to Ward for um, having become quite familiar with the archives, our substantial archive in Jesuitica at Fordham. Uh, and it's in that um, spirit of gratitude that I would like to welcome Ward Briggs, uh, uh, whose paper, Opening the Gates, American Philological Association Society for Classical Studies, 1970 to 2019, which will serve here as a capstone, but clearly a starting point for anyone interested in the last 50 years of our society's history. Ward, thank you. Well, thank you, Matt, for that nice introduction. And uh, thank you for putting together this panel. Thanks to my panelists for stimulating and um, interesting uh, presentations. And my thanks to you all for sticking around to the end, which I hope will not be too bitter. I can't in 20 minutes possibly do justice to the turbulent, exciting, transformative half century of the association's history. That will have to await a fuller print or digital version. For our purposes this morning, let me, like Aeneas, after the storm in book one, climb a peak and from that distant prospect look out and see how my colleagues have fared in the tempests of the last 50 years. If I peer too long into the distant 70s and 80s, it will only be to emphasize how far we've come. So imagine yourself a graduate student in 1970, about to complete a dissertation and in melancholy search of a job. You are at the APA between Christmas and New Year's. First, you would pick up your registration packet from a member of the local committee, faculty, or graduate students from a nearby school. Perhaps you would find the notice of a job interview, since in advance of the meeting, you sent in your very brief resume to the head of the placement office in hopes that someone would see your CV in the placement book and contact you, preferably in advance of the meetings, or perhaps by a note on the overcrowded bulletin board to meet you in one of the six interviewing rooms or too often in the hotel room of the interviewer. The chances were about one in three that you would get no interviews at all. You would find among your materials a program of papers delivered mostly by white males, there were six sessions, a number unchanged from 1883. The program was chosen from signed or solicited abstracts by a committee comprised of the president, two vice presidents, and the secretary treasurer, the pattern since 1931. Those delivering the papers already held established positions at well-known institutions. The majority of the literature sessions dealt with the familiar canon of authors, Homer, Virgil, Plato, Horace, Catullus, and the Elegists, the Tragedians. At this point, Ovid was still a marginal figure. Though upstart groups like the Petronian Society could be counted on for fresh and diverting pr presentations. <laughs> History, epigraphy, paparology, all were represented. Apprentice that you are, you hoped, if nothing else, to see a paper given by a master craftsman of our guild, Gilbert Hyatt, Bernard Knox, Brooks Otis, George Gould, Glenn Bowersock. This was still a professional organization run by amateurs. 
The presidency was largely an honorific title. The person most responsible for the maintenance of the society, the formation of the program, the annual meeting, and the editing of TAPA was the secretary treasurer, a male academic on part-time leave assisted, if he was lucky and his home department generous, by one secretary. All communication and record keeping was done on paper. The most technologically advanced device in the office was a selectric typewriter. The, the glue that held the association together was the commonality of interest, respect, background, and deep loyalty that characterized the leadership, mostly alumni of a handful of elite institutions, old boys snuggled together in a comfy old boy network. This intimacy is obvious from the familial tone of the analytic encomia that are the previous histories of the APA by Frank Gardner Moore in 1919 and Lucia Sherrill in 1964. In, as an example, in 1924, one, one member wrote, quote, for the last 24 years, it has been my pleasure to attend the meetings of the American Philological Association, and therefore I know what it means to have a good time. <laughs> So from my lofty crag, I will observe that the APA of 1969 had more in common with the APA of 1919 than it does with the SCS of 2019, which is to say that the society as described above has changed more in the last 50 years than it did in the previous 100. It has also taken a greater role as the arbiter of the world of classical study at large, not only by continuing to support the publication of research by its members, but by directly participating in major scholarly projects, and also by, assu by assuring transparency in its own actions and equity, in the, and equity in the ethical conduct of individuals, departments, and journals. In my opinion, two events of the last half century have been responsible for the transformation of this society into one that is simultaneously more transparent and more professional. The first is the establishment in 1972 of the Women's Classical Caucus. The second is the appointment in 1999 of a full-time non-academic executive director to replace the old and unworkable secretary treasurer position. The motto of our capital campaign was from gateway, gatekeeper to gateway. Before we could be a gateway to those outside our profession, we needed to be certain that the gates were fully open to all within our own profession. And in 1970, they certainly were not. Our student of 1970 has come to the meeting as students ever have, in the words of Frank Gardner Moore in 1919, not without the hope that such recognition would bring advancement in the academic world. From the 1870s through the 1970s, plum tenure track positions were generally arranged, as I confess was mine, without national advertisement, without a formal interview at the meetings, without campus visits by multiple candidates. Placement was accomplished by means of a phone call to or from an eminence at a graduate degree granting institution. I recall that as late as 1979, one senior member advised his students, only losers get their jobs at the APA. It was not until 1962 that the APA took its first tentative steps in formalizing its role in the placement of young, younger members when it published academic positions available, listing vacancies at five, mostly small institutions. Three years later, the placement service again announced only five jobs, as well-known large institutions preferred to keep their hires and their hiring practices private. By 1968 to 69, the bottom had dropped out of the job market, and the dire situation led the board in 1970 to name a director of placement, a secretary, Mrs. Starker. She periodically circulated small job lists and set aside six rooms in the hotel for interviews. 1971 to 72 would be the, f the worst job market until the recession of 2008. President Nixon had slashed education budgets. Pressure had begun to build on the APA to take a role. And in 1971, positions for classicists listed only eight possible positions. But it was later announced 
that at least 17 candidates had found employment. Clearly, after 10 years, a number of universities still preferred the old boy network. In response, a committee led by Phyllis Gordon in 1972 defined the APA's position and laid an imperative on departments. Their statement read in part that while the association was only an intermediary working in the interest of providing equal opportunities to all persons seeking academic appointment, nevertheless, quoting, it is a professional obligation for all classics departments to inform the Secretary of the American Philological Association of all positions for which more than one candidate is being considered. There was no shortage of candidates. In 1972, there were 519 requests for interviews, and two years later, there were 750. And by 1977, there were over six candidates for every open position. In 1974, 33% of all candidates received no interviews at all. 58% had one to six interviews, and 9% had seven or more interviews. The proportion of men to women had remained fairly constant in the early 1970s at roughly two and a half to one, but by 1979, there were 164 male candidates and 101 female. Gradually, the old boys acceded to the new order. By 1979, the placement office listed 32 open positions and 25 possible positions. But the placement, under, placement service under Ms. Starker was still in an inchoate, if not chaotic, state. In his first year as secretary treasurer, Roger Bagnall recruited his parents, who were highly capable and organized public school teachers. The oak tree never grows far from the acorn. And thus, they were free between Christmas and New Year's. They took charge developing a system that was both orderly and professional, even if that meant staying up into the late hours the night before the meetings began to finalize the schedule of interviews. The prototype that they established proved efficient and su successful through the rapidly withering job market and the efficiencies of the digital age. Among the initial list of 164 subscribers to George Comfort's invitation to a philologist's meeting in 1869 were eight women, only two of whom became members after the first meeting the following July in Poughkeepsie. We led professional organizations by having our first female president in 1900. The MLA, founded 15 years after the APA, did not have a female president until 1954. Um, the association uh, elected Elizabeth Haidt, uh, also of Vassar in 1934, and Lily Ross Taylor of Bryn Mawr in 1942. Up to 1970, only seven women had been president of the APA. Since 1970, 34 presidents have been men, and 16 have been women, slightly half the presidents were women. But in the 21st century, the numbers are tilted slightly in the opposite direction. 10 men have been elected president, 11 women have been elected president. The 1960s, by which I and I think most people who use the term uh, refer to the period between 1968 and 1976, was a, was a period of flux and mobility. Young people coming into the world of affairs did not accept with placid deference the established order of government, society, or culture. The contagious protests over, the, over civil rights, and then the Vietnam War, and then women's rights, had given the boomer generation a voice that empowered them to use it as so soon, to soon shake our windows and rattle our walls. This was certainly true of the post-war generation of classicists. The APA was in a growth spurt. We acknowledged our size and diversity by meeting in San Francisco in 1969. Our first meeting in the West Coast, in fact, it was our first meeting west of Iowa City, Iowa. Most of the progress towards transparency, equity, and inclusion that marks the present Society for Classical Studies would have been impossible, or at least would not have been accomplished so quickly without the impulse created by the Women's Classical Caucus. In 1974, according to Ms. Starker's placement office report, quote, and this is her grammar, not mine, the average woman candidate has less opportunities for an interview 
than a comparable male candidate. And only a few exceptional women fare as good or better than men with the same qualifications. Indeed, the only women who had a pathway to power or influence in the association were from the elite women's colleges. As Helen North put it in her 1976 presidential address, this all began to change with the founding of the Women's Classical Caucus. The history and achievements of the caucus have been written up in detail, most notably in 1988 by Judy Hallett. And I only have time to note them here, but I hope that this brief mention does not diminish the revolutionary and overwhelmingly beneficial effect that this group has had. The nomination process was conducted by three and later five ex-presidents of the association, unchanged from 1870 through the 1960s. The election ballot that our hypothetical job seeker of 1970 received was Soviet style, with only one candidate for each office. <laughs> Nevertheless, 754 members still felt compelled to vote. <laughs> The old guard consider, considered it bad form to compete with other colleagues. But women and members at smaller institutions knew that their only chance to share power and responsibility in the association was to press for competitive elections. In 1972, directorships were, for the first time, competitive. And 1,344 ballots were cast, double the number of the previous year's uncontested ballots. In 1973, Eric Havelock challenged William H. Willis for president as a write-in candidate. Despite the unspoken agreement among the old guard against competition, George Kennedy wrote a letter to the membership on behalf of, quote, classicists against the election of Eric Havelock. <laughs> Willis wrote, Willis won 986 to 343. J.P. Sullivan's write-in campaign for second vice president against Jim Oliver was unsuccessful. In 1973, there was only one candidate for president, Harry Levy, and one for second vice president, Harold, H Helen North, the second vice president would succeed in two years. But the first officially contested election for president, Bill Anderson versus Lloyd Daly, took place in 1974. In 1980, the second vice president, directors, committee on publications, committee on award of merit, committee on smaller departments in various regions, and especially the nominating committee were all contested. As a result of opening up the elections and the nominating process, by the 1980s, women were increasingly involved in running the association. For the first time, two women, Julia Gaser and Susan Wiltshire, were elected as the directors in 1982. But 10 years later, when two women were the nominees, the only nominees for president, a write-in campaign was launched for Ludwig Kernan as president and Richard Thomas as director. The women's vote was split and Kernan was elected. Thomas was not. One of the losing candidates, Helena Foley, was happily elected president in a later election. More and more women were elected president as we've seen so far in the 21st century they lead the race by one. In 1970, the program and thus and TAPA were compiled opaquely. The old guard confected the programs to showcase their already prominent members because as one member put it, since some of the most distinguished scholars in the country attended the meetings with great regularity, an opportunity was provided for younger members of the profession to observe these respected figures at close range and gain profit from listening to them. The Committee on the Status of Women and Minority Groups pressed for blind submissions of abstracts to the program committee and, um, and, to, and to TAPA. One result was that many of the grandees did not have their blindly submitted abstracts accepted. Another result was that female participation both in TAPA and the program increased by 30%. If certain eminences were not seen, exciting groundbreaking presentations by scholars like Alessandro Barchiesi, John Biagio Conte, or Joe Farrell made meetings memorable. Most important, Helen North pointed out that one year after blind, as I said, after blind submission, it, uh, female participation increased by 30%. The meetings themselves became unwieldy. The old notion of small meetings in small places was gone. In the first 50 years of the largest meeting, our largest meeting was at Princeton, totaling 115 attendees. 
but the average at meetings was about 90. By the 1969 meeting in San Francisco, there were 99 papers. For the first time at that meeting, the canonical six paper sessions were broken into three sections each. In um, today's program has nine sessions and 94 sections. So 100 years ago, we averaged about 90 attendees. 50 years later, we had over 90 papers, and today we have over 90 sections. The program is more often now a showcase for the innovative and diverse work of graduate students and those just entering the field than for those of proud name. The Committee on the Status of Women and Minorities, now the Committee on Diversity and the Committee of, on Gender and Sexuality in the Profession, developed, distributed, and gathered departmental surveys regarding diversity, salary equity, and quotas beginning in 1972. These surveys are now an annual widely accepted event. It was not so at the beginning, and are collected and analyzed by an outside firm. The WCC sent questionnaires to candidates for election regarding issues of importance to the caucus. The APA SCS adopted that idea of requiring candidates for office to answer questions of interest. The caucus also pressed for surveys of journals that were not under the umbrella of the APA and pressed regional groups to adopt many of the transparency policies that were, they were encouraging the APA to adopt. That adoption became easier as members of the WCC, and I want to emphasize that they were both, both male and female. As my dissertation director said when he once did this to a microphone, pardon me. And I want to emphasize that they were both male and female, were acquiring power in the association thanks to the more equitable nom nomination and election process. The accumulated results of the departmental census led the, to the APA forming the Committee on Professional Matters to examine discrimination and harassment in hiring and tenure decisions. This is not the end of the WCC story by any means, but it is all that I have time for here. To rattle off this list, however incomplete, of accomplishments is not to imply that the WCC had an easy time of it for the first two decades of its existence. There was resistance to an outside group interfering with the privacy of a department's or a journal's business, as when the WCC called for a session at the APA to discuss Georg Luke's circular AJP Today which gave a narrowly crafted definition of philology, of, his, of the philology that his new editorship of the journal would accept. Eric Adler has detailed this controversy thoroughly and very accurately. But the WCC was in the process of instructing our field how to behave fairly, transparently and professionally, and it has led the APA SCS to be a far better steward of its charges. As long ago as our 50th meeting, 100 years ago, it was clear that the association had grown to the point where dues alone could not sustain it. An endowment committee headed by Fairfax Harrison, the president of the Southern Railroad, and George Plimpton of Ginn and Company as treasurer raised $25,000. The death of Lehigh University professor Charles Jacques Goodwin, a member for 44 years, in, he died in 1935, brought a bequest of $60,000 and safely guided the association through the difficulties of the Depression and also brought the association to the point where, as one member wrote, the somewhat casual financial arrangements that had served adequately in early days were no longer workable. By 1964, the Finance Committee, with the help of a very conservative Wall Street brokerage, had doubled the endowment to more than $50,000, but it was all income to pay current expenses. In 1980, we changed invest investment managers and launched a capital campaign to take advantage of the bull market of the 1980s, and we did very well. By the 1890s, the association, in the 1890s, the association gave over $2,000 to support Lewis Campbell's projected Plato lexicon, which never came to fruition. Burned by that experience, we did not substantially support an outside project until the dawn of the digital age in the mid-1970s, when a committee on research tools and programs called for the APA to support major projects, some of which would be digital, some traditional, but to do it through institutions, since we lacked the manpower or the budget to take on these projects by ourselves. 
We could and did, however, supply consulting committees chosen by the profession to supervise large projects, like the Data Bank of Documentary Papyri, the Barrington Atlas, the Database of Classical Bi Bibliography, and the Database of Classical Scholarship. Exhibit A was the creation of the American Office of L'Anne Philologique in 1968. Housed at the University of North Carolina, first under T.R.S. Broughton and then George Kennedy, it was maintained by annual grants from the NEH. Our hypothetical graduate student of 1970 would likely have relied on a volume of L'Anne Philologique that comprised 824 pages. In 2000, its last year of printed publication, the Anne had 1,000 more pages, 1,773, and 16,603 entries. It was not clear to the NEH at this point that print publication was the future of bibliography, and they announced that they would no longer fund it on an annual basis. This caused considerable anguish, if not downright panic, among traditionalists, and especially the younger members who relied on it for dissertations and early publications. When no other institutions were willing to take it on, the APA decided to forget, if not forgive, Lewis Campbell's lexicon, break with its longstanding policy, and take full responsibility for the American office of Blané. To do so, we would need another endowment drive. And fortunately, we had the perfect person in place to manage such an enterprise. By the mid-90s, it was clear that the need of the associations were beyond the capacity of a part-time secretary treasurer. Meetings were regularly topping out at 2,000 registrants. We had a very unfavorable and costly arrangement with Scholars Press, which published our monographs and TAPA, managed our website, and collected our dues. In addition, the offices in New York at Columbia University were getting expensive. Most of the association's documents, budgets, minutes, and correspondence were still on paper rather than in digital form. And we needed a full-time professional to save us from the brink of insolvency. I say this as a member of the Finance Committee at the time. Streamline our office, contract out our membership, out the membership and meeting responsibilities, and help us apply for the grants that would support our new large project. Again, there was resistance from the traditionalists. If we hire a professional, we must pay a professional salary, which meant quadrupling our budgeted outlay for the position. In short, paying the equivalent of a very well-paid, tenured full professor. In our parlous financial state, that seemed a risk that might sink us. When one loyal member observed the situation in good faith, he said, we can't afford to hire a full-time executive director. The situation told us, we, can't, we simply can't afford not to. Adam Blistein was a true Hermeneus. With a PhD in classics, he had worked for 17 years as a manager at a large grant-supported organization. The University of Pennsylvania generously offered office space in the classics department and an occasional work study to supplement the two members of his staff. He extricated us from the scholars' press, made favorable arrangements with Johns Hopkins University Press to handle membership, with Oxford University Press to publish our monographs, and began to sophisticate our website. He began the process of converting our record keeping from paper to digital form. He enlarged the newsletters, oversaw the creation of the outreach division, and began Amphora. With the advice of the Finance Committee, we changed investment managing firms, just at the wrong time, but he, and despite a disastrous 1999 meeting in Dallas and a number of members lost in the first six months of 2000, we were out of our financial straits in five years. Membership grew and meetings became even larger. The Philadelphia meeting in 2012 drew 2,800 registrants. But back to the ANA crisis. Adam knew exactly how to set up a capital campaign and found a wonderful advisor in the person of Lara Mandeliz in Washington, D.C. The capital campaign, called from gatekeeper to gateway, was a monumental success. It was the first time we had asked the membership to significantly support our endowment. As generous as funding agencies were, the campaign would have failed had not the membership accepted a culture of giving in a way it had never been asked to do before in our nation, association's history. This culture is now a permanent part of the society that will ensure our future. Strategic planning is now an ongoing job of an official committee. Adam, in 1999, managed an endowment of $3.5 million. At his retirement, it is now $8 million. We owe him more than we can ever repay. 
And in 2013, we changed our name with less than a majority of members approving. After our first 25 years, we already needed a name change. We were not truly American because we didn't include in Central America, and we were functionally the American Classical Philological Association. In recent years, the term philology has, be, has seemed increasingly recherche. My students always thought it had something to do with stamp collecting. I will just say that whatever we do, we will be doing philology as described by our master, Basil Gildersleeve. I should reiterate, wrote Gildersleeve, the confession of my faith in the formulae of my youth my belief in the wider conception of philological work, <coughs> excuse me, in the necessity of bringing all our special investigations into relation with the whole body of philological truth, the life of the world, the life of humanity. At our beginning, we were pan-philological and became exclusively classical. Now we are classical philology, but a great deal more. For all its 773 pages, the 1970 Lane did not list items in the classical tradition, reception studies, cultural studies, film, the history of classical scholarship. The field is broadening and diversifying more than ever, and philology will ever be at the indispensable heart of what we do. In 1969, it was common for classicists to know Hebrew and other Mediterranean languages. And 150 years later, the, with the burgeoning study of Greece and Rome in a Mediterranean context, and with the rise of documentary disciplines, we may have to become even more philological than ever. I'll close with two quotations from our distant past that should summon our energies today. In 1874, President March's presidential address asked, what can philology do for the future? What forces can she supply for improving the estate of man? In 1885, President Wood William Watson Goodwin ask the vital questions that have been the concern of our 150 presidents, from William Dwight Whitney to Joe Farrell, and which should we should all ponder on this, our great sesquicentennial. What have we done to justify this long existence? And what do we propose to do to justify a new lease on life in the future? Thank you. I do understand that uh, this session is technically over, but I also understand that there might be a question or two, uh, and I don't want to be rude. I don't know if there's another uh, session coming in here, but Ward, would you take a question or two if, if, uh, if we have them? I know it's time to go, so. Um, there is a question here. <laughs> In the early in the early years, it was after about after the first uh, I think fifteen years, it was quite common for us to meet with other learned societies. As those learned societies were coming into existence, uh, the American Historical Association, the American Anthropological Association, which took off, which peeled off certain remits of the original APA, uh, American Anthropological Association, for example, ha would handle the Native American languages that we were doing. In AHA and so forth. So we commonly met. Um, the uh, when we, I think, oh, hey, I'm thinking 1915 or so, when, when we first met with the AI, I'm not sure. Oh, but oh, 04. But it was very, it was a very closely knit meeting. The first night, the president of the AIA would, would uh, I'm sorry, the president of the APA would officiate, and the president of the AIA would give an address, and the next night it would be the reverse. And we all met together. But again, those were smaller, much smaller meetings. Um, uh, but certainly the, there was one year we did not meet with the AIA, and after that uh, we, we consistently met, though we seem to have grown uh, uh, into separate venues. Uh, okay, I think on that note, um, it's uh, time to conclude, but join me once again in thanking our panelists for this um, very stimulating group of papers and discussion. And
Uh, thank you.